Well, hey, everybody, it's Wes McDonald here, and I want to thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tiger Tube. And if you can't see us, that means you're listening in on Tiger Paw Radio, so thank you very much. And listen, before we go any further, hit that subscribe button. Tiger Paw produces a ton of educational content designed to help you better your business so you can sleep better at night. It's all free. It's designed to help you uh, to learn in new ways, and that's exactly what we're going to do uh, today. And I'm super excited today. Uh, my guest uh, that I actually have on is Brendan McFall. And if you've not been on his LinkedIn page, you should check it out. And uh, so Brendan, I'll, you know, uh, basically give kind of like a short overview. So obviously, you, uh, your East Coast Operations Manager for Northland Controls. And the topic that we're going to be talking about today is the security industry and AI. And before we jump into that, maybe you could introduce yourself for audience because nobody knows you better than yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Again, thanks for having me on. So obviously, my name is Brendan. Um, I've been with Northland Controls for my entire career, We're coming up on almost nine years now, which is amazing. Um, I, I've been f- uh, fortunate enough to be in a variety of roles. I actually started as the executive assistant for the CEO. Um, I did that for a year. Uh, and I told you know our owner, uh, I love working for you. I love the company. I love the culture. Um, but booking your hotel and your travel isn't exciting enough for me. I need something, something else, something new. And so I got thrown right into project management. I found myself running uh, installation projects for um, the physical security industry. So card readers and and cameras, access control and and video. Installing systems for Fortune 50 companies uh, from Boston to Miami. Uh, After six months, I started to get a little bit comfortable and figuring out what I'm doing. And then I I was asked actually if I wanted to go over to Asia. So I spent six months in Asia um, as our interim general manager of Asia Pacific. I traveled all across. Southeast Asia, you know, I was based in Singapore, went to Indonesia, uh, Thailand, South Korea, Taipei, Malaysia, all over. Um, had an absolute blast. Uh, we found a permanent uh, GM who's still with us today. So Kagan uh, came back to the U.S. and I said, all right, well, I've gotten to learn things um, from an executive level, sitting in board meetings. I've spent time, you know, installation on the installation side, learning hardware, experiencing different cultures. Um, now let me get into engineering. Um, and so I came back as a technical project manager running system upgrades, you know, custom integrations, again, for, you know, the Fortune 50 companies um, that, that many of you know today. I, I ran those kind of jobs for three years. Um, I then took over our technical engineering team. So I managed both TPMs and the engineers that made those configurations happen. Um, I did that for two years. And then just recently, within the last year and a half, I've moved back over into operations and managed um, a portfolio of about $60 million a year uh, in installation work. So again, it's been a, a wild ride. I wouldn't change a second of it, um, but it's pro- provided me with the opportunities to learn about a lot of things that we're going to talk about today. Well, you, you cannot make this stuff up, right? Like starting as an executive assistant and then doing all the things that you've done already in the span of your career, right? And uh, certainly that is for anyone watching, um, uh, you, can, you can do it. I don't care what you want to do. That's just absolutely one of the most inspirational introductions I've ever heard. So thank you for that. Wow. And listen, as someone who has risen through so many various roles, uh, obviously at Northland, which is incredible, um, how have you seen the integration of AI and physical security evolve over time? I mean, it's everyone's talking about AI right now. Um, It may be new for generative AI, but it's not new for AI in general. So what kind of things have you observed? What kind of significant changes? Yeah, absolutely. So, so again, I've been in the industry for almost nine years now, and it's unbelievable the the rapid growth in technology and, and implementation that we've seen. So, if I go back to when I joined, you know, the industry back in probably 2014, um, I saw a lot of systems uh, with functionalities built in. So, for example, and for example, we're talking about access control systems when you use your badge to to get into the building, right? So you would use your badge or credential, you'd badge that reader. If you have access to that front door in the office space, for example, the door would open and you would would walk in. Um, We'd also employ operators um, who would watch the system and see if that door opens without a valid read, we would get a door forced open alarm. And all of a sudden we would wanna view probably an integrated uh, video stream associated with that door. And the operators would physically watch and say, all right, is there an incident? someone pulling that door open um, and breaking into the space and verifying via video. So it was all very manual, should we say. Um, I would say the first kind of wave of iteration that I saw was in um, algorithms being written into the software. So an example of that would be um, if I have a, uh, I'm going to use a video system, for example, we could put a perimeter uh, around a building or office space 
and say, if anybody crosses this line, send an alarm, right? So we're no longer needing, you know, visual verification from an operator's perspective. We can have the system send those alarms. And so, you know, again, using that example, think about, you know, a retail space that you're trying to protect after hour. The next wave that we're seeing now, specifically using AI, is in machine learning and anomaly detection. Um, and so, again, you, we have platforms that are able to learn certain types of environments and identify behavior that's taking place that's outside of the norm. So, again, you know, using um, uh, we'll stay with the retail space um, idea, if you're seeing a crowd uh, protest build up um, outside of that space, when traditionally you're used to seeing a, a single stream in and out of you know people coming in and out of the retail space, but now the, mach the machine learning is able to identify it. this is a strange behavior. We're having a crowd crowd gather in the front, we need to dispatch a guard or just somebody to verify what's going on. Now you're talking about the difference between reactive security and preventative, right? Because now we're able to actually identify risks before an event takes place. So that is where the industry is trending towards. And we're seeing, you know, again, that new iteration of AI. When, and, I, and for me, I really focus on what are the anomalies in machine learning that these systems are able to identify uh, without a trigger, like a door force, be, you know, door being broken open or a visual verification of somebody watching a camera stream. Well, and, and that has to have such a dramatic impact on the uh, speed of response, right? That when you get rid of that manual layer, and, and I got to think as well, I mean, humans, you know, um, we're error prone, right? So what if we're not paying attention? We see it in the movies all the time. I know it's not that bad, you know, where they've got the security guard looking at the video feed and then somehow they, you know, yep. pull them not into watching the feed, right? But, you know, the computers don't sleep. They don't get bored. Uh, the algorithms, you know, just do what they do, right? And, and I absolutely don't want to, you know, I don't want to discredit operators at all. You know, no, we no, no, have a security sure. operations center and they are a vital yeah. piece of that process. However, what this technology does is it does increase both uh, the uh, accuracy of, of those alarm responses while also making those operators more efficient. Yes. Um, you know, any operation center will tell you one of the biggest challenges they have is in false alarms coming through. And they're spending 99% of the time looking at identifying and clearing false alarms. But again, to your point, you know, imagine that an operator now, every single alarm that's coming through has been verified through AI and an integration of different systems. And again, now we're talking about increasing your response time, increasing efficiency, bringing down the cost of monitoring and ultimately increasing, you know, service to the customer. So those are all, you know, it's all integral, um, but it's going to allow for an increase in efficiency. Yeah. And actually, I think we should change the name of it from artificial intelligence to augmented intelligence, right? That it really just does allow operators and and I've seen it in other spaces, if it's accounting uh, or if it's uh, creatives that are, uh, you know, running blogs and e-guides and other things, right, that it does not replace them, but it does get rid of those menial tasks, which none of us like to do anyway. Absolutely. Right? Yep. That is, what do they call it? It's busy work, right? So yeah. get us away from the busy work and into, you know, some more of the strategic stuff. Um, you've spoken about the potential of AI and analytics and preventative security measures, right? And can you elaborate a little bit about some of the specific AI technologies or advancements that maybe you're seeing uh, playing a crucial role right now in that preventative approach? Yeah, absolutely. So the space that that my company primarily operates in is in corporate real estate. Um, so the the office buildings for the big tech companies, um, where they're maybe designing new products or software or, or what have you. So I want you to I'll give you another use case. I think that this kind of technology is best described through use cases. Sure. Um, I want you to imagine an IT professional um, that goes into the office typically on Mondays and Wednesdays. You know, he's hybrid. He goes in two days a week and works from home. You know, uh, the other three. Uh, this individual, because they're an IT professional, has access on their badge or credential um, into the IT closets where they're, all their networking gear sits, the switches, the servers, what have you. Um, it's not unusual for this individual when they're in the office to badge into those rooms. But like clockwork, you know, this guy is in the office Mondays and Tuesdays. He's never in on Fridays. Uh, a traditional access control system would show that this person has access configured on their badge to that space. And so let's again imagine that on a Friday, we see a valid card read where um, the person uses their credential, badges the reader, the door unlocks, and they go into that IT closet on a Friday. Again, traditionally, there's no alarm here. There's no um, need to investigate. This is an individual who's credentialed to get into that space. Um, however, if we were to run the access control data through um, an application capable of machine learning and a learning and anomaly detection, that system would identify, hey, this is actually a very strange behavior 
um, the individual that's badging into the space has not been in on a Friday in the last three years or since COVID, um, we should actually investigate and send a, either a guard to that individual to say, hey, is, the, is this person's badge been spoofed or stolen? And so is there a bad actor in the space? You know, and you can do that via a variety of ways. You could send them a, a text notification and say, hey, can you confirm that you're in the IT closet? There's a bunch of ways to respond to those scenarios. Uh, but my point being is, tr you know, in traditional access control, we're not capturing those events today or even monitoring for them. But again, if we're able to run this access control data that's hugely valuable through these kind of platforms, we're able to identify those anomalies um, and investigate and potentially save, you know, bad actors from, from carrying out those attacks. Yeah, I, I could think of a you know a personal example in my own life, right? Because I travel extensively. Um, before uh, we actually talked about the call, I said I was actually coming across Buffalo right through security there. I was at an event last week at the BTA. And of course, being a Canadian and then being in the US using my credit card, that's a different behavior than it may necessarily see, right? And there was a one point actually where I was refueling for fuel and it was a rental car, so I had to give it back. And you know how they are. It's got to be full, right? So I thought it was full. It wasn't. Yeah. So I put my credit card back in to, to do the refill. And that action actually did trigger uh, my bank to get in touch with me to make sure it wasn't a fraudulent thing going on. And it was like that, right? So that wasn't a person. <laughs> that, was, yeah. uh, that was just the algorithm, right? And sure enough, text, I respond back, yes, that it's me. And then we were good to go, right? But wow. Yeah, and that's exactly the kind of, you know, interactions that I'm, that I'm, describing and I'm seeing implemented, you know, further, you know, using the fraud department as an example, I was meeting with one of our customers in Las Vegas at IIC West, and they told me that they actually export their access control data into a, a database that then their internal fraud department can monitor and run queries through. So these are individuals, you know, just in the situation you described, they're experts at identifying anomalies and behavior and, and in data. And so by able to export the access control data, which generally has the location, the individual person badging into different you know, places and accessing different spaces, they're able to pick up on those anomalies. If I were to, you know, further kind of the example that I had given, you know, imagine that you have, you know, a different employee who always enters through a garage, they badge into the garage space, they come through, then they badge into the front door, they go get their cup of coffee and then sit down. Now imagine instead that this person, you know, come, the, the badge is being presented at the front door, but there's no badge into the garage, right? And then furthermore, this person hasn't come to the coffee or cafe area and just goes straight into the IT closet, hasn't sat down at their desk, hasn't logged in their you know, traditional work pattern. Again, this is a scenario in which if they were to have access to these spaces, it wouldn't typically be flagged. But because the behavior is different than what they've traditionally you know, followed, now all of a sudden it's, hey, this is an, an event worth investigating. Wow, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, and uh, I can tell you right now, uh, I'm not a runner. If an, anyone ever sees me outside running, that is an anomalous behavior. Please call for help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, that's great. And listen, in respect for time, I do want to move on to our uh, next question, right? And you've talked about this idea of integrating access control systems with other applications, right? So like vaccine trackers, uh, as an example. Um, and how could this lead to the creation of uh, a smarter and healthier you know, buildings. How do you see AI helping there? Yeah. So I want to use. I want to go back to the COVID era because that's for sure. me when things really um, flipped for for us in at Northland. So I was meeting with uh, one of our engineers, and he came up with the idea of utilizing access control to track um, uh, pe uh, people's movements within building and identify once they've you know highlighted or raised their hands that they've contracted COVID, who they may have come in contact with. And so uh, one of our engineers actually wrote a script uh, that would query access control databases and say, all right, if Brendan was in the office on Monday, uh, you know, he bagged, he badged into the front door, he badged into the cafe at 10 a.m. He then badged into a conference room and had a meeting at noon with this person, this person, and this person. We could then run that script through the access control database and be able to send a notification to the people that I came in contact with at the cafe who were in, this, in the same place as I at the same time. And furthermore, in that conference room and say, hey, you were exposed to an individual who tested positive for COVID. You know, please you know, take the proper precautions, go get tested, what have you. Right. And so that is where for us, we saw a tremendous um, value in 
the data from access control. We then wrote subsequent, you know, reports around um, utilization. Uh, so at the time, you know, there were regulations that restricted how many people could be within a certain area or office space. Oh, sure. And yeah. so we wrote um, reports that tr that showed and trended. Um, are you coming within max capacity? Do you need to, you know, again, as a retailer, do you need to, you know, close your doors or limit the people that are coming in? Or if you're in an office space, you know, maybe you only set thresholds for how many people are granted access into your building on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and you change that access for people on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so you're not exceeding those capacities. So we sought a lot of value in access control data for, tr for tracking, you know, vaccines. We also, you know, wrote an integration where you would need to provide proof or verification of, you um, of having uh, received a vaccine in order for you to get into the building, right? So that was kind of our first wave. When we then take a step back and say, what are some of the other existing systems that we can integrate with? Um, and two come to mind that, that make a lot of sense financially. So when you think about heating, you know, the expenses of maintaining a building, two of the big ones are heating and cooling, so HVAC, yep. and the second one is lighting. Uh, especially when we're in the environment where we're in today, in which you know sometimes buildings are being utilized only part time and people are in a hybrid work state, there's no need to heat and cool a building all day every day. If the majority of your employees, or if your employees are only coming in on Mondays and Wednesdays, why are you heating the building or cooling the building afternoon on Friday if everyone's working from home? Um, or, or, or the same thing for lighting, right? You know, let's say that you have a workforce that typically likes to come in early and everyone likes to start at 6 or 7 a.m., but by 2 p.m. the building's empty. There's no reason to light it from 2 to 5. And so, you know, when we start talking about smart buildings and the integration of systems, being able to utilize access control data, look at, you know, when your building is being utilized and then make intelligent decisions and cost saving decisions um, to heat and cool your building, to light your building and some of the other, you know, downstream systems. Now it enables what is traditionally a cost center uh, security to be a, uh, a money saver and bringing money back into the business because you have a direct savings and cost for heating and cooling. That, that's incredible. And that's, I mean, I, I can tell you previous to this interview, I'd never really thought of the implications both for health and uh, the pandemic is a great example. And my wife is a retailer as well. So that's one of those things that she had to do um, was actually measure out the space and then control the number of people that were allowed in at any given time, right? But when she was permitted to have uh, people in the store um, and imagine that at scale. So if that's Walmart or if that's one of these other larger, you know, organizations where you simply, it'd almost be impossible. You're going to, you know, have a clicker at the front of the building, right. To right. monitor the number of people. And, and you can and, do this via cameras too, right? It doesn't have to be actual sure. badge swipes and access control. There are, you know, um, cameras and video systems out there now that have people counting features. And so you can set a, you know, a certain space and say how many people are in this location, send an alarm or trigger an event, you know, when we exceed that capacity. Uh, so there's a multitude of ways of, of you accomplishing this. Yeah, actually, I did uh, some research and curated a guide on uh, computer vision and, you know, what's happening in the security world, right? And that was one of the fascinating examples that I ran into was that when you're at one of those self-checkouts, right, when you're, you know, kind of checking out your groceries, that that the cameras, the intelligence built in them is actually counting the number of items that you're, you know, scanning through uh, versus the number of items that you pay for, et cetera, and looking for those kind of behaviors, right? It's, uh, yeah, it's a brave new world. <laughs> wow. And North Line Controls, more specifically, is successfully implemented, uh, customized return to the office solutions. We are coming back to the office. I saw that uh, uh, companies like Google are actually mandating it. So we're going to start seeing a lot more of that, I think, especially with those uh, large organizations, right? And for the solutions, how have you been incorporating aspects like the uh, HR vaccine tracking applications with uh, customer access control systems? And do you envision AI helping to enhance these solutions in the future? Because we just got through the pandemic, right? I was commenting at the show that I just got back from where I was speaking on artificial intelligence, how normal it felt, right? We kind of get lulled into this, you know, we're back to normal, but, you know, can can AI and the systems that you are uh, deploying out there help us not to get lazy about this? Like, what do you see in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we talked about a, a number of examples already, like yeah. anomaly detection and behavior, you know, integration with building automation systems. Um, another big one for me is in workspace planning. So we had a customer uh, who worked in a very large campus type environment, and they would seat individuals in certain buildings and floors and areas based on their job function. So for example, all of the accounting individuals would sit and work together. All the people in sales would sit and work together. All the project managers would sit together. Um, what they found, again, through querying access control data was 
it, uh, the majority of the meetings that these individuals were in were not with people in the same job function. All the accountants weren't just meeting together to review numbers. It was actually a member of accounting meeting with a member of sales, meeting with a member of uh, IT or engineering. And that was the team that they were working most closely with. And so they found, again, by you know running this data set through machine learning, were able to identify that people were traversing huge swaths. Um, again, it's a big campus environment. They're spending 20 or 30 minutes traversing the campus from one building all the way to the other corner just for this meeting. And then when you multiply that by the hundreds or thousands of people that are on this campus environment, imagine how much time you're losing uh, by asking people to navigate and go walk to these buildings. So again, as we're planning for this return to work, as we're looking at you know, office utilization and space utilization, can, uh, this company then decided to collate co-locate uh, individuals based on the teams that they're actively working with as opposed to departments. And again, uh -huh. we're talking about cost savings back into the business, you're increasing efficiency. And now the member from accounting, IT and finance are all sitting you know, next to each other and they just turn around and have a conversation and sort out whatever it is, the issue that they're trying to solve versus having to traverse or you know, get on a virtual call. If you're gonna have people in the workplace, you wanna make sure that you're, they're located uh, in a space where they can be most efficient. So again, just another example of how we can you know, utilize these data sets and use AI to identify those anomalies and also search for um, additional efficiencies that we could implement. Well, in so many areas outside of what most people would think of, right? So, I mean, we've talked about uh, we've talked about health and wellness. We've uh, now talked about uh, planning. <laughs> like, you know, it goes beyond security, which is uh, really absolutely right? what a trifecta. And listen, in respect for your time and for that of our viewers and listeners, we are moving on to the last question. And one of the things, you know, as well as I do in the tech sector, uh, diversity is a huge problem, right? That we are you know, pretty much, uh, you know, dominated by uh, one type of uh, person, if you will, I'll leave it at that. But as a leader who believes in the importance of diversity in the security industry, how do you think that maybe the rise of AI uh, can help us to better influence uh, representation for folks, uh, you know, that are that are more diverse? I, I do think that we're uh, looking for and bringing on a new breed into the industry. Um, I think traditionally we would have, you know, individuals that would, you know, start out in the field, they'd work their way up to a project manager, they may make operations manager, director, and et cetera. I think now we're seeing a real convergence between, you know, physical security, so the installation of devices, uh, but equally um, cyber and the protection of the IP-based IP systems that we install every day. So all of our access control systems now are primarily IP-based. Our right. video is network-based, right? We're all connecting into switches. We're recording video either locally on-prem through a, you know, a, a Land or streaming maybe direct to the cloud and accessing it through cloud networks. So we're looking for people with a different skill set today. Um, you know, as an integrator, we're often looking for people that have, you know, networking or cyber experience. We want people that have experience, you know, installing and maintaining systems in a cloud environment. We're also looking for people that, you know, are able to manipulate databases, SQL DBAs, um, and then lastly, you know, we're talking a lot about AI today, people that have experience in um, manipulating large data sets and running, you know, that information through through AI platforms for that. And, and I'm loving to see, you know, the new types of, of people that are coming into our industry. I love it. And it's it's so funny, like I kid you not, today we just released um, a podcast interview with Michael Gibbs and uh, over at uh, Gibbs Insights. And the interview was actually talking about that kind of the merging of uh, some of the cyber or digital security with some of this stuff that's happening in the physical world as well, right? So thanks for, that's kind of a nice segue to push another uh, another interesting episode that we've just done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, I, I listen, I cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your busy day to, to be part of this interview. Uh, we do love to share these things. And what's the best way that people can get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more about what you're doing uh, at Northland? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm big on LinkedIn. Please do look me up. You know, Brendan McFall. I'm at Northland Controls. Again, you'll see the the picture of the Jeep in the background. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Please reach out directly on, on LinkedIn. I'd love to get in touch. All right. And listen to everyone that's either tuned in and watched us on uh, TigerTube or listened in on Tiger Paw Radio. I cannot thank you enough. And do not forget to subscribe. If you like this content, make sure that you like it and share it with other professionals in the industry. Uh, all of this content is free. We're excited to help you learn, to help you better your business so you can sleep better at night. And until next time, keep learning.